Today's show is filled with information and fun. We'll start with Gene Mills, head of Louisiana Family Forum, major force in values for Louisiana. Representative Katrina Jackson, former head of the Louisiana Black Caucus. Senator Neil Reiser, a, also a major player in Louisiana politics. Neil is also a candidate for treasurer of the state of Louisiana. We, we have a special interview that you, you won't believe until you see it. A special guest who's going to appear today. That should be fun. And of course, we will close with, as we always do, a few words from our friend from Lawtel, Louisiana, T-Boy Fontenot. Watch some of this you won't believe. This afternoon, we have a special guest, Gene Mills, Reverend Gene Mills, who is head of the Louisiana Family Forum. Welcome. It's good to be with you, Albert. It's my pleasure good to see you. Just talking about your old hometown, uh, we're both from the same neck of the woods. Opelousas, Louisiana. Yes, indeed. Great place to be from. Family Forum has had some incredible successes. This year, you've had uh, very good success during the legislative state. Close to 30 victories. Tell, tell us about those 30. Well, there's a number of victories that go into the pro-life issue, that go into the educational issue, that go into limiting taxes. Uh, it spans the spectrum. Being a, uh, a non-regular session or a special session that deals with fiscal matters only is a limited number of the social issues, but we were able to provide a voice for traditional families and to do so successfully. We did have a few setbacks. Uh, we find that it's much different when the fourth floor is not necessarily on the same side of all issues as, as has been in the times past, but we can also navigate a conservative and traditional legislature. And that's true of both D's and R's. There are a lot of things that we have in common. And because of that, we've seen a great deal of success. That finding that common ground is one of the reasons why you've been so very successful in the, in the state legislature. Mm -hmm. Tell us, how is it, what is it, what's the technique? How is it that you build those uh, consensus? Well, communities are made up of different folks from different backgrounds and different diverse interest groups. And, I think it's relational and being in, from a ministry background, we understand the concept of community. It's built upon relationship and relationships can be made up of people who have very diverse views, sometimes opposing views, vigorously opposed views. But there are ways in which we can communicate in a civil manner that allow disagreements to be expressed, but agreeably. And I think we've, we've kind of lost that in this generation. Now, there are many today because of the unfortunate shooting of our good friend, Steve Scalise in D.C., that are crying, peace, peace, and prayer, prayer, and our empathy. And, but those were some of the same voices that were the most vitriolic. You have been a leader in education. What, um, tell us about that. What, what made you, why? is Family Forum involved in education at all? It's really more or less the educational choice. Now, constitutionally, our lawmakers are required to provide a system of education for the 700,000 uh, kids who are currently in a public system. The unfortunate thing is, right now, we have uh, too few options for kids that actually functionally work. And we think there's a moral imperative. You only get the chance to educate a child one time in a lifetime. We got to do that well, and in order to do that, we believe the idea of competition helps to encourage that. So, we're a big advocate of homeschooling, virtual schooling, private and parochial school, as well as government schools who specialize in key areas. And we tried to loan a respectful voice to that idea of parental choice in education. Every child ought to be given a chance. I have eight children. We have chosen to homeschool my children, even though my wife was a public school teacher. We realized the petty pay that you get, we give to our Louisiana teachers uh, was not necessarily worth what was not necessarily a teaching environment. It was a babysitting environment. So we decided to pull her home and to focus our attention on some special needs that we had in our own home. And we found it to be a very effective way of training up champions for this generation. And I think there are other parents out there who feel the same way. They're going to make good decisions for their kids. We need to empower that. One final question. The Republican Party is involved in expanding 
republicanism, expanding our values. You've been very successful at doing that, expanding values. Can you give us some advice? Yeah, I think it's we've got to continue to do it relationally. We've got to make certain that we pledge our allegiance, from my vantage point, in the Lord Jesus Christ and the liberty He provides. And as we do that, it bursts ideas in the public policy arena like respect and dignity for human life, like respect and dignity for the, for the human family, and particularly the role of the father in the home and the role of the mother in making decisions about their child's education. It gives with respect to economic choices an idea that what you've earned ought to be yours to keep. Our old founders used to believe it was a violation of the Eighth, Ninth, and Tenth Commandments. You had to covet what was not yours. You had to give a false testimony and say, you ought not have it, he ought to have it. And then you had to go take it illegitimately through a legitimate institution of government. They were very wary of taxes, except that they accomplished a constitutional purpose. Well, I read the Bible the same way, a textual vision of the Bible. It interprets itself and it bears witness to itself. Our Constitution does the same thing. And when our government does that, it respects limited, local, honorable, constitutional government. And that's something we can all celebrate because it empowers you to make decisions for you and your family and your business and church. And that's where liberty comes from. Absolutely true. Wise words. It's good to be with you, Albert. Gene, thank you so much. Always enjoy it. Hi, Roger Vilry, Chairman of the Louisiana Republican Party, and I'd like to welcome you back to our new series uh, that we're talking about minority outreach in the state of Louisiana. The Republican Party is so excited that you're here with us today, and hopefully you enjoy this as much as you enjoyed our, our last segment. So looking forward to being with you today, looking forward to working with Albert uh, Guillory. Uh, Senator has been just uh, doing a tremendous job, and I, I know you're going to get some good information on our show today. So stay tuned, and uh, thank you for being here. You have all heard of the big brouhaha over Confederate monuments, Confederate flags, and many of you have asked, where is this all leading? What's the next step? Well, one of the next steps is that students at LSU are circulating a petition to get rid of the LSU Fighting Tiger mascot. And they want to do this because 170 years ago, during the Civil War, there was a fighting unit in the Confederate Army called the Fighting Tigers. Well. We decided to talk with the tiger about this whole thing and, and get his opinion. This afternoon, we have a fighting tiger. Mr. Tiger, how are you today? Fantastic. I'm having a great day. I had two chickens for lunch. Man, I love chicken. Well, Mr. Tiger, let's jump right into this. Have you ever owned slaves? <laughs> no, no. But I do have two white guys who take real good care of me in my cage. What is your position on the Civil War? Dude, the Civil War ended like 150 years ago. I have two positions, standing up and lying down. Do you have a preference, a racial preference for, for black people over white people or white people over black people? Oh no, no, I like them equally. They both taste like chicken. Tell me, what do you think of the students who are circulating this, this petition? Oh, I like students. They're usually tender, and they taste like chicken, too. Mr. Tiger, what do you think of this whole Confederate issue 175 years after the war? <laughs> I guess next they'll want to change the name of LSU and the whole state because Louisiana's named after Louis XIV and Anna, his wife, and both of them supported slavery. Why don't you people stop fighting a war that ended 200 years ago? Get a life. Fight today's wars for better education, better health care, and more chicken. Wow, you are really well informed for a tiger. Thank you for being with us today, Mr. Tiger. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen, directly from the tiger's mouth. And have you ever talked with a tiger up close? Their breath smells like chicken. 
We have a very special guest, Senator Neil Reiser, who is in the legislative session as we speak. Right. Tell us what's, what's been going on at the, at the Capitol. It's, well, it, it's it, it seems like sure. the last several sessions, Edward, it seemed like a lot's going on. We, we just, uh, Sonny died, which we adjourned out of a session last week and immediately went back in another one. They would fail to come to agreement on a budget. I, what we're wanting to do is to set some money aside. We've seen the budget grow exponentially yes. and up around $28 billion. When, when you were there, it's even up more. And there's some of us that just think that that should be trimmed back and maybe put some on the side. A revenue estimate committee meets quarterly and every year it seems like they come in and say that we're going to be a little bit short. So what we want to do is be able to set some aside rather than having to come back in. We'll already have that little bit of savings there to, just in case they're wrong. It seems like they're wrong all the time on it. So that's the concept. Well, we have had a series of mid-term Correct. corrections mm -hmm. um, just based on that alone. And, that, that and that's, what, that's what we're trying to address. It, <laughs> what you have to budget for is what's been estimated. So what the estimated income will be, but the estimation has been off. So I'd, it might be better to say it's a guesstimation than an estimation. We had a, a, a treasurer who was a very strong a opponent, excuse me, proponent mm -hmm. of fiscal responsibility. Absolutely. I, I understand that uh, he's, he's not with us in the treasurer's uh, office anymore. He's, yeah, he's a United States senator. I want to congratulate him numerous times, but will again. What, uh, what's Louisiana going to do to fill his shoes? Well, at this time, I'm, I'm wanting to fill his shoes. I'm a, currently a candidate for the state treasurer's race. That election is going to be on October 14th. Uh, when John Kennedy left from Treasurer and left to the U.S. Senate, Ron Hens is now the acting Treasurer. Ron is not, is not going to be seeking the election, uh, but I'm actively campaigning right now. I feel like I have the expertise to, uh, in the values and the history with my work, work relationships that I've had to be able to move this forward. Tell us a little bit about, about your background before the legislature, yeah. and then we'll talk about that one also. And, that, and that's one of the things <laughs> I think that Edward makes me uniquely qualified on this also. I, I started working in the timber industry when I was 14 years old. That's logging, which is, is, was and is the most dangerous occupation in the world. So I was 14 years old when I started there doing that. Did it for nine years. Uh, I quit because my father died when I was 22 years old. He was 50 when he had a sudden death, had a heart attack. So I came back to run our family business at 22. Um, we have funeral homes and mortuaries. And so I ran that from then to present day. I have um, 23 years of banking experience, so I've got the finance background, and that's really what the treasurer's office is. That's, that's, the, that's the person that takes care of the checkbook and oversees and the expenditures of what's appropriate in the budget. You've, in, in, the, in the Louisiana legislature, you have also um, Correct, yeah. worked with fiscal matters. Yeah, I've, I've been on revenue and fiscal affairs. That's the, that's the budget that comes through for all the, everything's going to be bonded out comes to that committee for all infrastructure, with roads, waterways, what it might be. I've been on that committee now for 10 years. I chaired it for four years, so I have a working knowledge of working with division and also served on the bond commission, which the treasurer served, chairs. He chairs the, uh, the state bond commission. So I've been on the command, I've served on there for four years. So it just happened kind of, a, to me, I, I still see, I've seen myself as that young logger and the, the work ethic goes with it, Albert. I've never had a, a five day a week job. Uh, never know what eight hours, never, never had that. Uh, so, I mean, work, work, ethic, work ethic that I have, I know, and it's not any different than the vast majority of the people in Louisiana. So that's not saying that to, to get any, but everybody, I, a lot of us have all grown up in Louisiana. It's just a way of life for us is working like that. That's absolutely yeah, true. All over this state. I've been working outside of the home since I was eight years yeah. old. And that's, when I, that's what I say, and I, I had the luxury of starting when I was 14. What, what changes would you make in the treasurer's office? I would, first of all, I would carry on what Kennedy has done. John has done a good job. Quite naturally, every individual is different. So you know that as a member, uh, guess another member takes someone's spot. So, you know, it, it'll be, a, you know, your personality, you come in, things adjust a little bit. But what I'd like to do is, is have, and I don't have a name for it, but come in and just be state's checking account. Whether you can come in and easily access it, where you can get on and see what monies are inside or what our treasury have. Exactly what we have, where that money's being sent to. And get that more 
just where the everyday person come in and look at it, and just like you're looking on your bank statement. And if anybody out there has got any great ideas what the, the name should be other than just state's checking account, that, but let's, let's start with that where there's complete transparency. And we'll work, that's the first step I would like to take. You live in North Louisiana. Correct. But you have uh, many contacts across the state, mm -hmm. certainly in, in, in Acadiana. Whether it be the Acadiana, so I, I come down in the Florida parishes, uh, on the Baton Rouge delegation, I'm on the Central Louisiana delegation, and I serve in the Northeast uh, delegation. So yeah, I, I, just, I just think that I, we became close friends and serve a lot of people, even individuals that I might not agree with, we, we personally can, can sit down and have a conversation about why do you think this way, why am I this way, and respect our ideas, even though we may not agree, but uh, let's move forward. So I think that's partially what the reason I've been able to be successful as a legislator, just willing to listen. You've been known, you've developed a reputation as a bridge builder. Yes, sir. Uh, would you take that characteristic yeah. with you? Yeah, yes, I would, because anytime you're, you're, these are mostly, will be projects that's coming for a bond commission. There are people that some of them are for it, some are against it. Serving on the bond commission, you'll see people come in, and you have to take those skill sets again to be able to do that, to be able to solve a problem. Just the answer of, like, I'm not going to talk about it, that, I've never been that way. So it doesn't matter. My office door is, and I always will be open. If someone wants to come in and present a different side, it might be something like Albert Einstein. You know? I'm not say I have a crystal ball or anything. <laughs> so, and I've, I've been known with somebody saying, I, "Hey, I never looked at it that way." So I think that's the way you build bridges, per se. Senator Riser, yes, sir. Senator Neil Riser, yes, sir. Thank you for your service. Thank and you. Good luck on Thank the next you. step. Thank you. Representative, how are you today? I'm good. How are you, Senator? Katrina Jackson, long history in the Capitol, a former uh, staff member of the Black Caucus, head of the Black Caucus, now representative from Monroe. Yes. Welcome to the Elephant in the Room. Thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure to be on any show that promotes Christian values. Christian values, let's talk about Christian values for a second. You have been one of the leaders in um, protecting life as uh, these bills go through the legislature. Uh, how has that worked for you? Have, you? have you received some negative feedback from that? Well, anything you do that's right is going to be, going to be uh, fought with battles. I've received negative feedback. However, I've received an overwhelming amount of positive feedback and support throughout the state and especially in my district. Uh, I tell people all the time that I'm pro-life from the womb to the tomb, which means uh, my pro-life feels are only, only one aspect of those that are highlighted, only one aspect of what I believe in when I consider life and its importance. Taking a look at the bills that have gone through or, or that are in the hopper for the legislative session this year, are there any that will affect uh, life in the early stages? Uh, I think it depends on how you view legislative instruments that are pro-life. Uh, there is one that will. However, I look at the things that fund DCFS and our children as being able to, uh, are, as protecting life at its early stage as well. And so every time we pass a budget each year, I believe that that budget holds within, holds within it the ability to protect life. DCFS, for those who don't know what that is. Department of Children and Family Services. Uh, a lot of people just look at that as the department that looks after children that are in foster care, which is that, that's a big component of it. However, uh, it also looks at children and continues to look at homes that abuse children. Right now, in the uh, current form of the budget, state of the budget, that department is grossly underfunded to the point where our DCFS social workers uh, will not be able to handle the casework, which means uh, freeing children out of homes where they're being mistreated and abused. That's what, what I mean by the budget being able to protect life in its earliest stage. Uh, I've always said it's not uh, good enough for us to just say, have the child. Louisiana has a duty uh, that's incumbent upon all of us to love children from the time they're born, born and, and, and to continue to love them past birth. And that's what I've seen uh, Louisiana Right to Life do. Their new theme talks about not only protecting life of the unborn, but advocating for programs for those who choose life. 
Several states, or a few states I should say, uh, this year have attempted to pass laws that will restrict abortion. Are there any laws that was, would restrict abortion with respect to either time mm. uh, of, uh, during the gestation period or uh, procedures, procedurally? Um, are, are there any such standing in the hopper this year? Not this year. Louisiana is one of the leading states uh, on those issues. And so over the last few years, we, are, we have passed most of the laws that other states are now trying to implement. Uh, we've always been first in line to pass those bills, and we have, uh, when Senator Broom was here, she passed the waiting period, and also I think she passed the legislation regarding the viewing of uh, ultrasound before having an abortion. So all of those laws that you're seeing other states attempting to pass now, their current law in Louisiana. So we don't have any of those this session. With respect to the laws over the last decade, the ones that you referred to, um, that have restricted abortion. Have we seen any negative impact on Louisiana's people as a result of those? Have, have we, is there any move afoot to lessen the impact of any of those laws? We have current suits pending on a number of pieces of legislation. We have an omnibus lawsuit pending right now on four or five pieces of legislation that we passed, included in that as an act I passed about two years ago that deals with uh, physicians having uh, access to hospitals that are performing abortions. And that's really not a restrictive bill, that's a women's health bill. Uh, I tell people simple like this, every surgical clinic in Louisiana is very different from Texas law and anywhere else. In our law, we uh, ensure not only that they have admitting privileges, but they're on staff at hospitals for the surgical clinics for removing a simple mold. What we were shocked to find is that someone could form an abortion without even having admitting privileges in a hospital. And so when you look at what we require of people who perform simple outpatient uh, procedures that aren't considered truly surgical procedures and you compare it to what we were allowing uh, abortion clinics to do in our state, it became evident that there was a women's health issue. And, and what I tell you is this, and I tell people across the state this, is say, what does that mean? As simple as this, if you had an abortion clinic before that bill passed and uh, something happened and there was a complication, that physician could only call 911 like you could call 911 from home, from home. And they ha would have to wait on the ambulance and then send you an ambulance with very little treatment to the hospital. Because of the dangers of uh, what women face, what has happened is that some of those women are never able to have children when they do choose life. I've always said I've, I've never condemned a woman who makes that choice. Circumstances and little knowledge sometimes makes a, you know, make the choice for them and they don't understand the resources that are out there. But I don't want to see them when they make the right choice not have the ability to bring life into this world. And so that's a women's health issue. And that bill right now uh, is being uh, played out in the judicial system uh, along with a number of other uh, acts in Louisiana. So we do see some type of fight to uh, become very regressive on women's health because of a lot of our bills dealt with women's health. Moving from the, the issue of, of, of abortion, what is the most exciting bill for you this legislative session? Uh, my most exciting bill this legislative session has to be the package that's going through the process uh, where I'm carrying one of the bills on law enforcement training reform because it was a work of about six committee m meetings, about six months worth of work where law enforcement came together with the public, legislators, and other entities to ensure that we had a uh, cohesive package that everyone agreed on. A lot of people hear law enforcement training reform and believe that uh, it's against law enforcement itself. We've had the Sheriff's Association to sign off on the bill, the District Attorney's Association, police unions, and everyone, because what we did was give them an opportunity to have the records of uh, officers before they hire them, the prior employment history, which is generally very important to uh, sheriffs and heads of police unions and everyone else. And so uh, that's probably the most important bill that I have in my name right now, moving through the process. Tell us what would the, what specific changes would be made in the police officers' uh, training? What would they learn now that they have not learned in the past? There, there's more tactical training. We're dealing with escalated situations. There's also more race relation and community relation training that will be encompassed in there as well. So it's some, some of them, them have had some training but it goes a step further. Some of the more important components of it is this. 
Um, Part-time and reserve officers did not have to be post certified have post certification, which deals with um, gun training and how they handle themselves on the street. And so we're closing that gap because they still have the same duties. If you work eight hours a day or 12 hours a day as opposed to working four hours a day, you still have the same duties and rights on the streets. And so they agreed that it was time for every officer, be, officer to become post certification. So there is a phase in calls for those officers who are currently employed by uh, agencies to become post certified. And then uh, for those who are becoming post certified, there was another gap that those good law enforcement officers were really concerned about. And that was uh, that those who didn't really want to be post certified or had bad records, uh, you have a year to be post certified when you first enter the force, any force. They were switching to another force after eight to, to, to 11 months and that became a big problem. So now we're closing that gap where if you've been at an agency for a significant amount of time within your year's tra required training, that if you switch somewhere else, that, for, that law enforcement agency, agency would have to put you in training immediately. And so that was something uh, that the general public was worried about, but that was also something that law enforcement period was worried about. And we're closing that gap. And then lastly, we had a database that was very loosely uh, configured in what needed to be reported. Now uh, the head of agencies can, can pull, go into the database online and pull up the records of employment records of all officers before they hire them related to uh, civil rights violations, um, investigations where they were found to be in a wrong when someone was seriously injured, which was important, and also if they were convicted of a criminal offense in this state or other states, they'll be able to pull that up and make better hiring decisions. Very well done. I, I know that you're having fun. I know that you enjoy the uh, give and take of the legislative process. I thoroughly enjoy it. It's, it's a, um, to me, the legislative process gives you opportunity to speak for those who normally wouldn't have a voice in the Capitol. That's probably the most important job that we do every day is give people a voice, whether it's senior citizens, whether it's the unborn, whether it's those who don't understand the legislative process and have never visited the Capitol. That's Capitol. That's one of the best things about serving in the legislature. Also, welcoming, welcoming children to the Capitol from your district seems to be very enjoyable. So uh, a lot of people see us uh, on camera fighting and uh, arguing over bills. What they don't see is the behind the scenes meetings where Republicans and Democrats alike get along and, and share ideals on issues or when kids who have never been able to visit the Capitol come to the Capitol their senior year and become interested in a political process. So I thoroughly enjoy what I do. I appreciate District 16 so much for allowing me to be here. Representative Trina Jackson, thank you. Thank you, Senator Gillard. For joining us today. The elephant in the room. Absolutely. <laughs>we got a lot of Catholic people in Cajun land. And if you Catholic and you got the bishop there, sure, you chopping in some high cotton. Well, the bishop, he walk outside, he walk into the churchyard. He look, he see a bunch of little boy playing. They shooting some marble out there in the dirt, you know. He walk up there, he say, man, little boy, who want to go to heaven, raise your hand. Every little boy, his hand shot up like that, except Clovis. The bishop look at Clovis, he walk over there, he say, man, Clovis, you don't want to go to heaven, you? Clovis say, oh, man, yeah, bishop, I want to go to heaven. But I thought you was getting up a crew to go right now. 